Story 1. Went in to install satellite TV in a southern Pennsylvania home. The driveway was up a dirt road with lots of I shoot first, ask questions later type signs. Nothing that would give off a red flag in those parts. So I greet the guy at his door. It's an older home, but fairly large. Guy starts off by saying, I'm glad they sent the right kind of people out here this time. Went over my head, but I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry if you got a bad tech the first time. I see someone was out here two days ago, but never finished the installation past the in-home walkthrough. So I step inside, and I immediately see why my co-worker Tyrone had just got back in the truck and left two days prior. Cake robes on display in the living room. A Nazi flag proudly hanging from the wall. Lots of other clan-themed objects scattered about the decor. I'm thinking, my god, I'm white. That's why he said the right people. Now, my completion rate was down that month, and I just wanted to get this installed and get the f*** out of Dodge. So, I justify it in my head like I'm doing a good service. Like, if I don't install this dish, this racist guy can't watch Fox. Then he won't know what to hate. I must do my job. So, I get to work. Aside from that main room, the rest of the house is normal. Some kids' toys scattered around in various rooms and maybe a dog toy on the floor. Nothing weird. So when I got to the basement, I had to run the cables down there to get TV to two of the rooms. So I go down the stairs and the whole thing is empty. Not well lit at all. And off in the corner, it's like some plastic tarp squaring off that area. Like a FEMA clean room tent or something. Perfect. That's where I need to run my cables. So I start making my way towards it and I realize there's some shit in there. Like maybe storage. When I tell you a room has never given me such feelings of dread, I am not lying. I felt terrible, like I was sick to my stomach. The whole thing reminded me of those kill rooms from the show Dexter. In the middle of the room was a tripod. No camera, just the tripod. And then a box of videotapes right next to it. With various labels and such. My eyes skimmed, but nothing seemed like an evil label, just like dates and numbers. All around the room, taped on the walls, were children's drawings. Some sad faces, some happy faces, some more abstract like you'd find in a schoolroom. Children's toys also scattered all around. Two beanbag chairs were in the corner, both in terrible condition and stained with dark and green spots. Looked nasty. And then in the corner, a whole garbage bag of small children's clothes. Shits, pants, underwear. The smell was horrible. Behind one beanbag was like two water bottles full of yellow liquid. I'm guessing piss, a dead mouse, and half-eaten food. I can't say anything bad happened in that room per se, but I was getting a Silence of the Lambs vibe. So I finished the cables and book it upstairs to finish up. Told the customer he's all set. I locked the basement back up and made sure I left no trash. After I said basement, he had a look of shock on his face and said, Oh, I hope you didn't go down there. It's an absolute mess right now. Stuff everywhere. I was just like, nope, never went down there. Just peeked down the stairs to see if I left anything. I ran out to my van and floored it. Called my manager to report the home for suspicious activity and advised no one go back for service calls and to send a subcontractor only. Nothing sat well with me. Kids toys everywhere, but no kids room. More kids stuff in the Dexter tarp room. KKK stuff. Nazi stuff. It just felt off. That's the weirdest I've ever seen. Guy gave me a $20 tip though, so that was cool. Story 2. Went to an apartment building to do a structural assessment of the property. When it was completed, we were asked to go to an apartment where a tenant was complaining of extreme humidity in every type of weather, even though nobody else on the floor, or the ones above or below, complained of anything. So we get in there and are instantly punched in the face with humidity. We're talking about the rainy season in the Amazon. I have never experienced anything like it before. There were water droplets on every surface of the apartment. She has been pretty diligent at trying to keep the walls and stuff dry, but she was like 80 years old, and you'd walk through and the carpet was just like squish, 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 with water pooling around your shoes. She had this sliding door that opened up to her balcony, and from all the water dripping down onto that section of the carpet, there was a mushroom forest. We're talking dozens and dozens of mushrooms ranging from 2 inches tall to 2 feet tall. Just insane to see. So we start looking around and pretty quickly we see the problem. 
The lady was too elderly to go down to the bottom floor to do her laundry every time she needed to wash something, which apparently was multiple times a day. So she asked her son to install a washer and dryer in her apartment. First, it was against the rules of the tenancy agreement, but he also did a horrible job. There was no place for the dryer to vent out anywhere. So in his infinite wisdom, he took a big bucket, filled it with water, and then put the hose for the dryer vent into the bucket for some reason. She would fill up this bucket with the drain water from the washer as the hot air bubbled through it throughout the day, just unleashing buckets of humid water into the air. So you have this massive bucket that was pretty much a trough, taking up three quarters of her closet with this washer dryer setup taking up the remaining space. She created thousands and thousands of dollars in damage to the apartment. The whole flooring system had to be ripped out and removed. A lot of other things had to be ripped out too. I think all of her furniture was water damaged and swollen, and started to get moldy after the washer and dryer were removed. Same with a lot of her clothing and bedding and mattress as well. So she was out like $20,000 because her renter's insurance does not cover willful ignorance that causes destruction of property and belongings. Story 3. I was gutting houses in New Orleans, hometown, after Katrina. It was kind of crazy since everyone left town thinking they'd be back in a week, so you got a pretty accurate look at people's lives while erasing them from the property. I mostly worked in a big crew, contracted by landlords to go in and out hitting multiple properties in a day. My childhood home got six feet of water, so my parents rented a tiny apartment uptown by the river where there was no flooding, and a childhood friend was a property manager for three to four plexes a couple of blocks from our apartment, so I just worked on gutting those solo over the course of about three weeks. No flooding, but severe roof damage, so I was gutting down to the studs in addition to removing all tenant property. This was around January 2006. Pretty much everybody has something in their house hidden away, so we found plenty of stashes, drug paraphernalia, toys, etc. But one guy's apartment was so strangely... boring, is the word I guess. All he had in his kitchen was like 30 cans of Stouffer's chicken a la king, no plates or bowls or silverware, just plasticware and styrofoam cafeteria trays. Individual salt and pepper packets, but otherwise no spices or seasoning. Only some bottled water in the fridge. Thank God, because the fridges were the worst. Can still smell the decay from the couple that accidentally opened. His entire wardrobe was just solid primary colored sweatpants and t-shirts. And he had nine old war movies on DVD, but like literally nothing else. No art or posters on the wall. No books, no jeans or button-up shirts. Kind of weird. I had moved all the furniture out except for a big wardrobe. And when I did move it, I found a closet behind the wardrobe. In the closet, I found his work ID and saw that he was a skinny white guy with horned rim glasses and a thin mustache. The door inside the closet had a huge swastika flag on it. And there were a couple hundred VHS tapes of Pogo featuring skinny little white guys getting pegged by very obese black women wearing strap-ons. Another couple of hundred LP records that I later learned were Norwegian black metal covered with satanic imagery. A few sketchbooks full of detailed cartoons of unicorns with huge veiny pieces and a few dozen copies of the New Testament. The dude seemed so boring based on the rest of his apartment. I was almost relieved he had all this wild shit in his closet. Story 4. My f time to shine. I work as a nanny, and often a one-time babysitter for families who just need a quick date night. So I've been in a ton of houses. I have two that stick out in my mind. One wholesome, and one traumatic. The traumatic one. A family I helped out on the weekends lives with their grandparents. While cleaning up one day, the three-year-old gave me an iPad asking me to help her. In the process of fixing the app she was on, I closed the other tabs to help it run a little faster. The Photos app was open, with photos of huge titty girls on it. Disgusting curiosity won me out, and I scrolled through. I'm not kidding, there were thousands of big titty girls. Most were barely clothed or not clothed at all. A few celebrities. When I brought this up with the grandmother claiming it was probably a virus, she just laughed and simply stated, Oh, that's Grandpa's iPad. This is his collection. He's a big boob guy. Now, I have nothing against saving those pictures. You do you, boo. But when your grandkids use that iPad, wouldn't you want to be more careful? 
Also, about a week after I found the titty pics, I found a massive bottle of lotion hidden inside of the couch, where he sleeps most nights. Yeah, I am in the process of leaving that job for other reasons, but that one sure as didn't help. The wholesome story. Back in my home state of Illinois during COVID, I was a full-time nanny for a one-year-old girl. The family was absolutely loaded, so the house was always beautiful and impeccably decorated. In the basement, they had a couple of rooms. One a bathroom, one a crafting room with a mysterious door in the back, and one for extra storage. While the girl and I were playing in the basement, she led me into the craft room. We played in there for a few minutes before bringing me to the mysterious door wanting to go in. And at that moment, I'm pretty sure I'm about to die. This is going to be their murder den, and they'll hang my body Texas Chainsaw Massacre style. Now, just like an idiot white person in a horror movie, I decided to open the door and just accept my fate. And inside this room were a ridiculous amount of decorations. Halloween, Christmas, St. Paddy's Day, fall, autumn, spring, etc. The mother found us a little bit later and let me know that they love the holidays, and they like to decorate to the nines for their little one. Hands down the best family I've ever worked for. Story 5. My job is certified peer recovery specialist. Social-ish worker, kind of, but not really. I do outreach to people experiencing food insecurity, medical insecurity, living with untreated serious mental illness, substance use, etc. Maybe not the weirdest, but the most memorable was a man with severe autism. And our med provider suspected schizoaffective disorder. He had lost his job a few months prior, and his family. Well, long story short, his grandmother was paying for him to stay in an extended stay motel. Bad situation all around. I had been talking to him via phone for about a week, trying to get him to meet with me. He mentioned he was in a bad place and fighting depression spells, hearing things, but kept refusing intervention. He kept claiming over and over he was a billionaire who owned the place, and he just liked talking to someone. Obviously, I knew that wasn't true, but diagnosing people isn't my place. So I just kept talking to him to see if I could win him over and convince him to let me meet him. One day, I got a call from his grandmother, saying she really needed me to go to his motel room and talk to him. I got to the motel, walked up to his door, and didn't even need to open for the smell to hit. The only way I could describe it was if unshowered death itself was microwaving salmon while refusing to kick its chain-smoking habit. Turns out, the month before and the entire time I was talking to him, he had not left that room. Like, not even once. The motel manager was getting report after report after a health inspector visited about the smell. I finally coaxed him into letting me in the room, and it is an unknowable miracle that I kept my lunch down. Trash piling halfway up to the ceiling in every corner of the room, the bedsheets clearly several shades darker than their original color, entire takeout boxes stuffed with cigarette butts, piss-filled bottles because the state of the bathroom was just... mm, no and the guy himself had a visible layer of grease on him with bed sores. I can only describe it as seeing a man decompose alive. I guess the manager was on the phone with the police when the grandmother called, because they were there very shortly after I had arrived. They weren't as gentle about convincing him to get out. The whole encounter ended with four officers carrying him out thrashing, him going completely deadweight on them, and splitting his jaw on the pavement. Story 6 I posted this before somewhere, but it fits. I used to work as a tidy-up man, German speaker, sorry for strange words sometimes, and saw a lot of really strange things in houses, which had to be normal for the people. Maybe the behavior is considered an illness, but it's really strange anyways. So the people were already dead when we cleaned the houses. I was younger back then, and I forgot to take pictures. It was 10 plus years ago. The Bottle Lady She was a retired gynecologist and lived in her old doctor's office. The interior was from the 70s, and there was everything like in a normal doctor's office. But she lived in this thing with no bed and no kitchen. She slept on a couch in the waiting room. The only non-doctor's office thing was a TV she placed there. In the laboratories was a fridge for medicines she also used for food now. She was an alcoholic and drank gin only and brought the same small bottle home from a small supermarket, but she didn't throw away the empty bottles. She placed them all over the place. Everywhere, gin bottles on every surface, mountains of gin bottles. 
She only had a small path from the door to the couch, to the TV, to the toilet, and to the fridge. The newspaper couple. An old couple lived in a small flat, and the only thing they did was to sort and organize the free newspapers you find in front of your door. But they had a very special way to do the list. They cut every headline, every picture out of a bunch of these newspapers, and put them into ring folders. They did it for over 40 years. We found papers from the 70s. Every single wall in the flat were ring folders. But because at some point they didn't manage to do it right, they started to put the newspapers they still had to do on the floor. The floor in the entire flat was full of newspapers up to 50 centimeters. In their basement, we found a small box of plastic filled with stones, sand, and water. It was labeled Scoured and Packed 1968. In German, this hits the humor my college roommate and I had, and we still giggle about that. Abgekocht und engpackt. Story 7. Used to do appliances. Went into one woman's house who had a massive pentagram painted on her wall with candles and everything around it. Not like in a sh teenager messing around either. This could have been a set for a movie or something with how well it was decorated. She did not hide her Wiccan beliefs at all. In fact, it was all she wanted to talk about while I was working. She was very nice, and I don't judge people's beliefs at all. But, and I am absolutely not making this up, she brought me various meticulously prepared drinks in different glasses several times over the two hours I was there and tried to give them to me. I had to tell her it was against policy to accept food or drink. Then, when I was ready to leave, she tipped me with some homemade mead. Honestly, it was probably delicious mead, and I probably would have drank some of her magic juice, but I had other to do that day and did not have time to be Hansel and Gretel Ed. Story 8 The place used to be either a commune or a cult. There was a stained glass and concrete ritual chamber in the middle of the courtyard. Grand stairs leading down into it. The exterior of said pit was painted in rainbows like some kindergarten. The shaman boomer hippie guy was fresh out of followers and was taking in greener college kids to pay his bills, I guess. Even they seemed creeped out and spent as little time there as they could. One poor unemployed girl had to work for rent and was stuck slopping the hogs and goats out in a nasty pigsty. I figured shoveling pig was better for her than going into the pit with some creep old enough to be her grandfather. As my memory returns, the compound was rife with beat ass old Grateful Dead head tour buses, VWs, and other European boxes left behind by old rich boomers. Rats were everywhere. I pulled back a tarp and there was enough rotting food and detritus to get Addis Ababa alive for a weekend. All of it was taken from the food bank and left to rot. Story 9. Dealt with a rental. The damn living room had a 4x6 foot ICP flag hanging in mid-room. Mommy was playing some online game with the baby cooped up in a car seat on the table. Got upstairs and there was a Hitachi vibrator plugged into the wall and a shitload of dirty butt plugs scattered all over the mattress. Got into the master closet where the attic access was and there was a gigantic pile of unwashed crusty dildos scattered all over along with a bunch of kinky panties. If your idea of panties being sexy could act as a parachute for a space shuttle. Story 10. I don't know if this counts, but I'm a nanny, and one time I worked for an alcoholic mother. Each afternoon I'd stop by the house first, before walking to the elementary school to get the little boy. She worked from home, barely, and was always there. So this one day I walk in and the lights are all on. TV is blaring, but I don't see mom anywhere. I call out for her, and she doesn't answer. So I just went on and got the little boy. When we got home, he ran into his bedroom, as he does. And suddenly, he starts cracking up laughing. I go into his room to see what's so funny, and his mother is passed out on the floor, dead to the world. And she was in the position a baby sleeps in, butt in the air, face on the floor. Like her face planted, basically. I can't remember what I did after that, but I probably just laughed with him and said, Wow, she must have been tired, huh? Then I got him out of there and closed the door. Then I called the husband and told him to get his butt home and deal with his wife. I didn't work there for all that long. It was too weird. Story 1 I was stranded 20 miles from home in the rain and called my friend Chris to see if he could give me a ride. 
He called me a taxi to his place, and by the time I got there, I was exhausted, so he let me sleep in his bed while he slept on the couch. I heard a knock at the door and heard familiar voices. Chris was asking them to be quiet because D, me, was sleeping. They started saying things like, Hey man, just let me go in and say hi to her. Another friend of his was talking about how all four of them could gang me. At this point, I had my shoes on and I was ready to run, but Chris managed to get them to leave, and after they did, I opened his door and hugged him and thanked him profusely. Needless to say, he was a great friend with some very shitty friends, and that night, he protected me. Story 2 I was living in a mental ward at one point in my life. I had to share a room with two other people, and they were both total freaks. One time, when I was just waking up, I overheard a fight between my two roommates. One of them put on my clothes, and I mean all of my clothes at once, and the other was preparing to strangle him for no good reason. I waited a while to see how it would unfold, but it only escalated, so I got up and out of there in my pajamas to find help as fast as I could. Thankfully, the staff actually did help me. Story 3 When I was sharing a room with my cousin in a rented house at Cape Cod, my cousin, who was prone to dust allergies, usually fell asleep with a nebulizer. I was having trouble falling asleep and was tossing and turning. Eventually, my aunt came into the room to shut my cousin's nebulizer off and started talking to him in his sleep, saying how she loved him but that he was going to hell that he had to get right with God and fix his behavior, or hell would be all he knew. My aunt was never super religious or said these kinds of things to him when he was awake, so it was just weird to hear her stand over his bed and say it to him while he was sleeping. Story 4 So, this one is a little weird, but in 2000, I had surgery. They put me on anesthesia, and I was lying there waiting for it to kick in with my eyes closed. I remember one of the nurses, I guess, saying, yeah, he's out. Anyway, this new guy I'm seeing that I told you about, he eats my p so good. It's amazing. And I've always wondered if she really said that or if the anesthetic can make me have auditory hallucinations, as I was a super 22-year-old at the time. I've always wondered if I was just drugged and imagined it, because they injected something prior saying it'd calm me. To this day, I have no idea what it was. Surely, nurses wouldn't be talking about oral s*** immediately before surgery. I don't remember a damn thing after she said that. Like, I heard the sentence, then went out. For the past 23 years, I've wondered about that. Story 5 First time in the psych ward, just turned 16. I'm bipolar but didn't know it at that point and had only been taking Prozac. Not a good mix. Obviously, the first night was the worst, and I did not sleep at all. Around 3 a.m., they put another girl in my room. I pretended to be asleep. Shortly after, I heard her whispering to herself about how f***ed it was that she was there and about how her family would never talk to her again, etc. Next morning, I asked her what she was in there for while I was brushing my teeth. She proceeded to tell me, in detail, about how she tried to kill her family and run off with her boyfriend. Luckily, she did not succeed, as she was a small 13-year-old girl, and her dad was a pro wrestler. I still quite often think about how she's doing. Story 6 It wasn't so much weird as it was hilarious. But as a kid, we were told to sleep at 9 p.m. every Christmas so that Santa could give us our presents. I knew it was BS, but I went with it just so I can see what I got in the morning. Around 11 p.m., I heard my mom coming upstairs to take presents downstairs and put them under the tree. I guess my stepdad was done with it because I heard him clomping up the stairs in his Rockport boots and my mom whispering, Oi, Fatso, keep the noise down. Then he grabs a load of presents, accidentally drops one, and starts pushing it along the floor with his feet. And my mom goes, Pick it up, face. And I just start quietly laughing in my bed. It was so hilarious. Story 7 When I was in college living in the dorms, I had a roommate who was hardly ever around. But when he was, he always had some contrarian 
to say just for the sake of being condescending, just an asshole in general, and he'd frequently ask me how I planned on graduating. Granted, I was depressed at the time. I'd binge drink all night and show up to classes hungover, then sleep all day, generally just drowning my woes with booze. I have a blurry memory of coming back from the bars absolutely trashed, not being able to make it to my bed and just collapsing on our couch futon. At some point, my roommate woke up and I was still conscious with the spins but pretended to be asleep. He proceeded to bring me a bottle of water and covered me with a blanket, stood over me just staring with a sad look, and muttered, What the f*** are you doing to yourself, man? I don't think he would have been so nice had he known I was awake but it really put things into perspective for me. I was becoming an alcoholic, and everyone seemed to realize but me. Story 8. When I was 17, I was emancipated and lived on the couch of a lady I had met at church. She was allowing me to finish high school while living with her and make it to my part-time job. I thought very dearly of her and for what she was doing for me. I woke up late one day, and she and one of her daughters were talking at the kitchen table. I heard them talking very badly about me, and how they knew I wouldn't be there for long, and that they just had to deal with it for a little while. They said stuff about how I must be schizophrenic. They knew I had an aunt who suffered from this, and that I was damaged from the history of my trauma I had endured, and I wouldn't get very far in life. My heart sank, and I tried so hard to get out of there after that. Story 9. Not pretending to sleep, but similar. I started walking towards my boss's office to check up on something, and the VP of HR was in there as soon as I saw it was busy. I turned around, but neither of them noticed me. Heard the VP, who was in his 60s, commenting on how hot one of the 21-year-old interns was, and then asking how her performance was in the same sentence. Absolutely disgusting, and I'm so glad I don't work at that shithole anymore. Story 10 Worked at a warehouse where I would take naps behind a wall of boxes. One day, I was woken by the sound of kissing. I was a co-worker and hourly boss. Normal lovey-dovey type stuff turned into, I'm pregnant, you can't be, but I am. No, you can't be, I'm married. You said you were divorced. We are, sort of. You can't say anything, we'll handle it. Felt like I was overhearing a soap opera. Story 11 Anytime my kids are asleep near us or in the car, my wife and I intentionally discuss them but have conversations like me. You know, I wasn't sure how son's name would turn out, but I have grown pretty fond of him, her. I agree. It was touch and go for a while, but I think we should keep him. Me. What about the others? Two girls. Her. Well, they have been getting along lately, and given that they look alike, I say we keep them as well. Me. Well, we're going to have to work with daughter two and her vulgarity problems. Typically, this continues until one of them busts out laughing. Or if they stay completely silent, then we can begin discussing other adult things. If they toss and turn, I'll throw out something like, Daughter one would look good shaved bald, like a cancer patient. She could make cancer look good. She could make cancer look fashionable. Again, laughing or silence. Then we continue. Story 12. My mom is yelling at her boyfriend for cheating on her. I was 11 or 12 at the time and wasn't sure what to do, so beyond telling my best friends at school about it, I just buried it and pretended it didn't happen. They broke up a few months later, and thankfully she's now married to someone who loves her very much. There's a lot of conflict that she assumes I was sheltered from that I was actually exposed to, but I try not to bring it up. She tried her best to give me a normal, healthy childhood. Story 13. Once, we rented an apartment with friends in a small town by a lake. During the day, we were at the beach, and during the night, we were drinking and partying at a small local festival. One night, everyone arrived home at different times after each other. I was the third, and I arrived home to two of my friends sitting in the room next to theirs eating food that was not theirs. I laughed it off and went to sleep on the couch in the living room. They went to sleep shortly as well in their room. Then the rest of the group came home. They discovered that someone pillaged their room and ate all their food and started to investigate. Funnily enough, they overlooked the most obvious solution, that the two drunk guys were eating the food from the next room, 
and were thinking of some outlandish ideas. Like some people came over from the next apartment, or the one guy who came with them but arrived literally one minute earlier ate it. I was already laughing in silence. Then one of the culprits woke up and asked them what was going on. Now they started to blame him again, but of course he was denying it. I didn't see him, but from his way of talking I could tell he had the perfect poker face. He lasted for a good 15 minutes, but then he broke and confessed to everything. The others were obviously angry with him, but were asking why they ate all the food. He was thinking for a bit, but all you could hear him say with a weak and sorry voice was, Because I was hungry. This was so genuine and hilarious that I could not keep up my facade anymore, and I drove myself off the bed hitting the floor with a loud bang while I was laughing out loud. Story 14 a buddy of mine is black and married a white woman he met in college. The funniest part of this is he really is one of the softest dudes in the world. When he was in law school, we were out one night before another friend got married the next day, and we came back to their house to crash. He and his wife got into an argument. It was dumb, not a big thing. And there were four of us pretending to be asleep in the living room. My buddy drops, go run that shit on a white boy, which, again... This dude is baby shit soft, and we all just busted out laughing at the same time. None of us could hold it in. It is still so funny to think about to this day. Story 15. When I was 16, at the end of school, in UK, we did a hike for the DOFE award. It went fine, and the hike itself, though a bit rainy, was quite pleasant. I had elected to bring my tent for two people in our group. The other guy and I had been friends for a couple of years. He was okay. Maybe a bit odd, but okay. Well, while we were heading to sleep, I stuck my head out to look at the stars and listen to the teacher's chat because I'm nosy. They said some funny stuff, but nothing strange. Heard my tent mate shuffling around. Back inside, I started trying to sleep. Felt the other guy put his hand near me, then shuffled sounds. Turned over, he put his hand back on me, at which point I turned to face him to tell him to stop and saw him actively pleasuring himself while looking at me. What the hell, dude? He mumbled a sorry, then turned over. Not nearly as bad as most of these, but just f***ing weird. Story 16. After my son was born, I was laying in the hospital bed exhausted, and listening to my husband and best friend talk. This best friend was also pregnant, and lived with me and my husband for most of her pregnancy. Because my husband and I are different races, people actually often assume she was his wife and I was some sort of concubine or something. It didn't help that when they asked, I'd tell them we were an alternative lifestyle family. We weren't, but I thought it was funny. Anyway, none of that has anything to do with this story. I'm just setting the tone. So we're all in my hospital room. The baby is off for testing, and my husband and best friend are talking quietly while they think I'm asleep. That's when I hear it. The longest, loudest, wettest, most cartoony-sounding fart noise of my young life. It went on forever. And after it came a long, awkward silence where I'm pretty sure my supposedly sleeping face became redder and redder. This sound, you see, was me, queefing out what I can only imagine to be all the air that had surrounded my son for nine months. Then they started laughing, and I still had to pretend that I was asleep. I was mortified. To their credit, they didn't mention it when I woke up. Not right away at least, but at some point when it finally did come up, I had to explain to them that it wasn't flatulence. Story 17. Backstory. My mom killed my biological dad in self-defense when he tried to beat the shit out of her for the upteenth time. She ended up an alcoholic from guilt. She remarried to the man that would then raise my siblings and I. He ended up divorcing her as soon as we turned 18. He protected us from her abuse. Of course, not before sexually abusing me. Mom passed away and brother passed a couple of years later. And the remaining three of us don't talk much after that for various reasons. Ironically, my reason was fear of losing someone close to me again. So I just put distance between us. So I was asleep and I overheard my piece of sh ex telling his friend about how her mom killed her dad, her stepdad left and has nothing to do with her, and none of her siblings will have anything to do with her. I got out of bed and set the story straight. 
The lack of family in my life was hardly because I was a bad person. Just a bad person trying to tell the story of my life. Story 18. I was asleep in the house of my recently deceased grandmother. Suddenly, at a very loud volume was the cackling of two maniacal children right in the room. I totally sh myself and ran out of the room thinking it was the voice of my grandma trying to scare me. Turns out, I had left my PC on with my speaker set to loud, and my screensaver came on, which was the South Park Terrence and Phillips screensaver. Scared the crap out of me. Story 19. I was about seven when my dad insisted all of us kids go to bed right now on Christmas Eve, because Santa wouldn't come if we were awake. I was pretending to be asleep in my bed shortly afterwards when my dad tiptoed into my bedroom and left my Christmas stocking hanging from my bedpost. That's how I found out. I never let on that I knew, not even to this day, half a century later. Story 20 this is the opposite of the question, but I was 12 and we were visiting my uncle. He and my mom were talking and catching up, and I woke up but pretended to be asleep. I felt the greatest rumbling in my guts because we'd gorged ourselves on dinner, and I ripped the most massive fart, not holding back. It was glorious, but I didn't want to handle the fallout, so I pretended to still be asleep and his reaction was so hilarious. Good lord, that gave me internal bleeding. I had to fight so hard not to laugh. It was great. I fell back asleep pretty quickly. Story 21. Not entirely the same, but similar. In my freshman year of college, I lived on a co-ed dorm floor, and at some point of the year, I had my room to myself. One of my room keys went missing. Maybe a week or so after I lost it, at that point, they replaced my lock and I got a new key. I'm laying in bed and I hear a knock on my door. And at that time, I was suffering from depression and wasn't really up for interacting with anyone. So I didn't really say anything or open the door. And I pretended I wasn't there. But then I hear that it's a whole group of guys outside my door. One says something about finding my key still inside the lock in my door a while back and just... I guess he decided to just take it for himself. He knew my name and referred to me by name, even though I wasn't familiar with him. The other guys with him laugh about him having taken my key, and they joke around about it for a bit before I hear one of them try to put my old room key into the door. And when the door doesn't open anymore because the lock has been replaced, the guy abruptly drops the old key outside of my door, and I hear the group leave. Once they were gone, I finally opened the door. And sure enough, there was the key I had lost, right on the ground. And it wasn't until a little later that I came to the realization that those guys probably tried breaking into my room with that key when I wasn't around, or I was in class before the lock finally got replaced. God knows what they did in my room. Alright, I'm seeing the replies, and I'm just going to clear up here that it was probably only like 4 or 5 p.m. when this originally happened. I don't think the intentions were that drastic, especially given the time of day, but I'm assuming they were hoping I wasn't there, as I kind of suspect they may have possibly previously broken into Snoop. You know, to go through my drawers and stuff to look at my more personal items.